The time has finally come to update my $1,500 gaming PC build guide with a system that provides even better price to performance metrics, awesome 1440p gaming performance, and even some headroom at 4K too. Built around AMD's new 7900 GRE, a card that looks to really mix things up at this price point, with awesome parts that look great, perform well, and shouldn't break your wallet. Let's do this. The Aura 16X is a gaming laptop that is built to last with the latest Intel Core HX processors and NVIDIA GeForce RTX 40 series laptop GPUs, running at a maximum of 140 watts. You get cutting edge Wi-Fi 7 support, Microsoft Windows 11 as standard and power delivery over USB for speedy Type-C charging. The 16 inch 2560 by 1600 display is sharp and looks the part, while plentiful storage and DRAM slots make this machine powerful and upgradable. Learn more at the first links in the description below. Now, what have I actually picked for this build? Let's have a quick run through the parts and build the system as we go. Performance numbers will be a little bit later on. Now, as far as the CPU goes in this build, the best place to start, I think, I've opted for AMD's Ryzen 5 7600X. I obviously wanted to get a CPU that was strong for gaming. This build isn't really designed for video editing or rendering, and this chip ticks a lot of boxes in that regard. Six cores and 12 threads give a strong multi-threaded performance, while healthy boost clock speeds of up to 5.3 gigahertz give us great single threaded performance too. What's better than that is also its price. You can commonly find this for around $220. And if that wasn't enough, I think AMD at the moment is the better buy over Intel for a lot of use cases, mainly because the motherboards are guaranteed to support future upcoming 8,000, maybe even Ryzen 9,000 CPUs. Intel, on the other hand, are at the end of their life, and we're gonna see a whole new socket, whole new motherboard when they launch their next 15th gen chips, hopefully later this year. Now, obviously for our Ryzen CPU, we're going to need a Ryzen motherboard. And that's where this comes in. It's the Asus B650 Plus Tough Gaming Wi-Fi. Now this board is a really, really great fit for this system. Not only does it provide us with that AM5 socket we need right now and key features like Wi-Fi support and high-speed USB, but it also gives us a little bit of upgradability without wasting money. Examples of that include a Gen 5 NVMe slot here for future super fast Gen 5 NVMEs. It's got far more substantial VRM cooling than a lot of the cheaper B650 and A620 chipset boards, you're going to need that for the better power delivery and more powerful processor might have in future. As far as CPU installation goes, pretty easy. Lift up the arm on the socket, pull up the socket cover and drop the chip in. The Ryzen tech should read upright if you're looking at the board from the front. Then add the cover back down, pop the arm into place. It really is dead simple. That brings me nicely onto the RAM or memory for this build, which is Team Group's T-Force Delta RGB. Now, consider Consistently, this stuff ranks as the best value DDR5 we've had in our studio. And that takes into account a lot of massive brands, whether that be Team Group, Corsair, Adata, you name it, this stuff is consistently cheap, low latency, and pretty quick. Now, sticking with the aim of, I don't want to say future-proof in this build, but trying to make sure that it's good now and into the future, I've gone for a 32 gig kit comprised of two DIMMs. Few key reasons for that. A, dual channel performance, great. B, this config is one of the best value options. And C, it crucially gives us the upgradability to add in an identical set for 64 gigs in the future. Available in black or white, which is nice. And I'm gonna pop it into the gray RAM DIMM slots on the motherboard this time around. Go ahead and slide that into place. Lovely stuff, obviously it's RGB as well, which we can control through Asus or a sync within Armory Crate. So it all works through the motherboard system, basically. All that then leaves us to do with the motherboard is pop the SSD in. And again, I've focused a little bit on that value for money side of things. When it comes to SSDs, they've almost got too quick. And what I mean by that is previously, you'd try and buy the latest flashiest drive that's on the market because the extra speed not only made a massive difference to the feel of your system, but could help with performance too. We've kind of hit the point now though, where we don't really need all of that extra speed. And this Crucial P3 Plus is kind of a product of that. It's still Gen 4, so it's still quick. It's not a slow drive at all. And we'll offer you about five gigabytes per second read and write. Obviously, the read speeds are going to be considerably stronger on this than the write speeds, which tends to be the case more on a lot of those budget-oriented drives. As I say, though, we're not going to get any bottlenecks. You could still upgrade the card even to like a 4080 and see no major storage-inflicted issues. And it's still going to feel very snappy. For context, this thing's like still about 10 times quicker than the fastest 
SATA SSDs from a few years ago. So nothing to worry about. Top slot for this build, that is up to Gen 5. Obviously we're only using Gen 4, so no problems at all as far as bandwidth goes. Next up is the cooler. Now I've gone a little bit out there without trying to splurge too much by picking up Deepcool's AK400 Digital. Now, if you're trying to trim a bit of cost out of this build, just get the standard AK400. Personally, looking at pricing on various retail sites, including Newegg right now, I think the AK400 is still the best value option. The digital bit, which is costing about another $10 or so, gives us this hidden screen behind this gloss black RGB top plate, which actually shows key information like CPU temperatures for monitoring your system and adding something a bit more aesthetically interesting, I suppose. Now, the key advantage of an AMD-based build is that the back plate's already built into the back of the motherboard. That means all we need to do is add some screws, stoppers, and this plate, which will be installing the cooler onto before screwing the cooler itself onto the plate with the two screw threads that are poking up. Deep Cool have really got this installation down to a T, so great work. I'll leave links to this and everything else today at the affiliate links in the description below. Once that's all on, our motherboard assembly is then complete and we can go ahead and move this into the case. Now, for this build, picking a case is always going to be a little bit difficult and it comes down massively to personal preference. However, I did come to a decision. I've gone for the Montec King 95. You can get it in a pro or non-pro version. The only difference is the fans. Now, if you already have fans, you can save yourself money and get the non-pro version. Or if you want the fans included, you can get the pro one instead. You do get a staggering six included fans, which works out around about $9 per fan if you get the pro versus the non-pro. So they are good value for money. And this case, from my experience, is just one of my favorite chassis out there. With any case, the first order of business is stripping it down. Now, I don't mean completely taking it apart, but taking off as many side panels as you can muster is generally a very good idea. This includes both the side panel and also the top panel of the chassis, and then also the rear panel as well while we're at it. And that's gonna make the next stage, which is just sliding the motherboard in a lot easier. Built an IO shield on the board and all the standoffs are in the right place, so nothing massively to worry about. The motherboard should sit sort of on its own with those standoffs being slightly raised, which is a good opportunity to grab all these cables from the CPU cooler and thread those through the rear of the case and out the way. Now, we don't wanna faff about here for too long, as obviously it isn't screwed in, so it could fall out. Nine screws in total, three along the top, three along the bottom, and three across the middle will secure the board into place. All those screws come included in an accessory box with the King 95 Pro. You can see as well how well the motherboard cooled up, all matching very nicely and looking so far, so good. That then brings me nicely onto the power supply. Now, I know you all wanna see the GPU go in. However, putting the PSU in is gonna make our lives so much easier as wiring up key cables like the motherboard, GPU, and CPU are much more simple without the graphics card actually installed. Now this is one of my favorite PSUs right now. Seems like a weird thing to say, but it's such good value. It's ATX3, has 750 watts of output, is 80 plus certified, and with it being semi-modular, you basically get the CPU cable pre-plugged in, the motherboard pre-plugged in, and then nothing else. So we've got room here for uh, standard PCI 6 and 8 pins, SATA connections, as well as a 12 volt power connector, which is that new Gen 5 GPU cable. With it being ATX3, it's inherently more efficient too, and you can commonly find it for 80 to 90 dollars on Newegg. Again, links down in the description below. That means even the closest competitor from the likes of Corsair is still going to set you back probably another 10 or 20 dollars more. And while this thing's a bit more on the basic side, I've never had any problems with it. I am going to be plugging in the 12 pin PCI power connector and also a SATA power harness. The reason being that we may need one for all the RGB on the case as far as getting that working is concerned. So plug those two cables in, keep all your other cables safe as you may need them if you upgrade the system in future. We can go ahead and pop this in the rear of the case with it being a dual chamber design. It's nicely hidden away, but just make sure you place the fan in an orientation where it can actually get air. In this instance, that means making sure the fan is facing outwards a little something like so. That didn't sound good. Once the power supply slid into place, four screws at the rear. Again, these come included in the little toolbox that you get with the chassis. We'll secure that into place. Once the PSU in, I'm going to do the CPU and the motherboard power cable next. Now, I am going to be doing a full cables and wiring guide separately that uses this system as the example. So if you want to learn about all the front panel cables in a bit more detail, check that out in the card section now. Motherboard though goes to the right hand side. It's the largest one. You really can't miss it. CPU goes up to the top left and then the JFP1, which are those fiddly front panel cables, go to the bottom right hand corner. I'll pop a pin diagram on your screen now so you can see this in a bit more detail. As I say though, full video with a bit more, with a lot more detail linked in the description and the card section now. And with that all sorted, it's finally time to look at the GPU. AMD's RX 7900 GR 
GRE, standing for Golden Rabbit Edition. It comes from China. Now, this is a really interesting car. The original launch reviews were pretty mixed. Some people said, oh, it's okay. Some people said, it's fantastic. So which is it? Well, it bridges the gap both in price and performance between the 7800 XT and RX 7900 XT, a pricing gap that once stood at nearly 400 US dollars. That's now shrunk with this sitting at 549. That's gonna set you back around about 50 to 100 dollars more than the RX 7800 XT. For that, you get more performance that defiantly beats RTX 4070 Super across the board. Sometimes it will beat out the RTX 4070 Ti, but not the Ti Super, depending on the title, putting it in a really interesting position. I think it makes a lot of sense for people considering a 7800 XT, but those who want a little bit more as far as 4K gaming performance goes especially. You still get 16 gigs of video memory. You still get, obviously, support for AMD FSR 3, ray tracing, fluid motion frames. I won't go too much into detail of all of this, as you can read about that in our dedicated 7900 GRE review, now live at the link in the card section. Push back the clip on the PCI retention slot, slide the GPU into place. Is it gonna line up? I think it is. Yes. Click it in and we're good to go. Now, I've realized just, I was on autopilot earlier. I plugged in the PCI 12 volt power connector, which AMD GPUs still don't use. So I mean, I would like to see this adopted now all those fire problems have been solved, but I will need to take out that 12 pin connector and replace it with two eight pins, which I could secure into our Radeon on GPU. Otherwise though, I've got to say, I think this thing's looking amazing. The only thing then remaining is to add in, yes, yeah, some more fans. I kind of am a bit of a sucker in this case for fans. I think it just needs something at the top here because we haven't got a radiator to bulk it out. I'm going to add these cheap AX120 Montec fans into the top and then turn this thing on and see how good it looks for the very first time. I am really quite excited. <laughs> to look at performance and the RX 7900 GRE holds up actually really well. This is first evident in Call of Duty's Warzone where at 1440p high settings with FSR 3 enabled to try out AMD's latest DLSS equivalent technology, the build pulled in a frankly rapid 318 FPS on average. Now of course FSR 3 is helping us along there at that quality preset at 1440p, but disable this and you're still going to be seeing triple digit frame rates from this latest AMD graphics card. It was a similar story in Call of Duty's Modern Warfare 3. This time I cranked things up to 4K high settings to see how this card would perform at that higher resolution. Here the card achieved 134 FPS on average at 4K high with the original FSR1 enabled and set to that quality preset. The game looked great, 4K resolution super super sharp for this build, with the GRE providing better results than perhaps I'd anticipated. Starfield again is a similar story. Here at 1440p high settings, the RX 7900 GRE delivers 92 frames per second on average. Now, when you compare this on a graph against the likes of the 4070 Ti Super, you can see the GRE does fall behind, but it's still highly competitive against cards like, of course, AMD's lower end 7800 XT, and perhaps more pertinently, NVIDIA's 4070 Super and 4070 Ti non-Super variants. Move through to Hogwarts Legacy next at 1440p high settings, and in this title, the GRE closes the gap more tightly to the new 4070 Ti Super. The GRE delivers at 108 FPS on average. The game looked great, smooth, very playable, fantastic gaming experience with four FPS less than on that aforementioned TI Super GPU. That's impressive when you consider the pretty chunky price differential between the TI Super and the 7900 GRE. Moving through into Fortnite at 1080p competitive settings, because why not? The 7900 GRE again performs well with 312 FPS on average. Again, in our performance graph, it really holds its own against pretty much all all of the competitor cards from both AMD themselves and of course NVIDIA. Apex Legends 1440p high once again the build smashed it with 240 FPS on average. If you want a game at 4K we tried that too. 4K high and the GRE pulls in 163 FPS. So highly competitive at both 1440p and 4K settings. Move through into F1 2023 to wrap things up. My personal favourite game though I'm slightly biased. 1440p ultra high with FSR 2 set to the quality preset 
and the GRE delivered 208 FPS on average. The GRE is a card that's really pleasantly surprised me, and if you're not quite confident that the 7800 XT will provide enough gaming performance at 1440p and of course 4K, this might well be the card for you. You can check out this and everything else mentioned today for latest pricing and availability at the first links in the description below for Amazon and Newegg. Did you enjoy this build? If so, get subscribed. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.